Okay, then I think uh, we have a uh, we we should start slowly our today's colloquium. So we are very happy to invite Professor Satya Majumdar uh, as your, our third colloquium uh, talk of this semester of APCP colloquium. So that before uh, the colloquium, uh, I will very briefly uh, introduce Professor Majumdar. So he's a <clears throat> Uh, now is a professor in uh, CNRS at the University of Paris Saclay, right? Uh, currently, and he uh, studied uh, physics in India. So he had a, 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 a master and PhD in in India. So he got a PhD in 1992 in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, his PhD. Uh, thesis is about self-organized criticality in sand piles and driven diffusive lattice gases. So after the PhD, he uh, uh, went to uh, US, USA for a postdoc period. So he was in AT&T Bell Lab and also Yale University. After that, he came back to uh, India shortly. So he also the leader of the Tata Institute in India. So after that, he got a position in France so since uh, 2000, he was now in France. So the first, he was the first level researcher in the university, CNRS in the University of Paul Sabatier in Tours in France. And after that, he moved to uh, the current position, uh, the place, the CNRS, uh, and University of Paris Sud, or say France. And he's now the research director of this uh, unit. So he is, uh, he got uh, many uh, awards, so but I just uh, I cannot uh, list all of them, but a few of them is the uh, Gay Rusa Humboldt Prize, and he also got the EPS Prize for statistical and nonlinear physics, and also he got the CNR silver medals, and I was surprised that he also got a Paul Langevin medal for uh, theoretical physics. So uh, so I was I was surprised by this. And then he, uh, up to now, he has uh, more than 300 publications in uh, research journal, which include uh, more than 70 period papers and some other papers. And he's leading many uh, areas. So some of them uh, I just list and uh, is the, about extreme value statistics of strongly correlated variables and stochastic process of resetting that, that today he will introduce. And he also uh, uh, an expert in the stochastic process and first the package problem and also uh, also polymers and uh, quantum phase transition in disorder uh, chain. Uh, so that will be a very short uh, introduction of Professor Majumda. So today I really happy to uh, listen to his uh, uh, talk about stochastic setting. So please welcome uh, Professor Majumda. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> thank you Jai Yong. Uh, for this very kind and nice introduction. And uh, also I would like to thank Professor uh, Kesio Kim and, uh, and Professor Jion for, for inviting me to this uh, prestigious uh, APC colloquium. And uh, I'm really honored and pleased to be, to be here with you today. And uh, so the subject that I'm going to talk about today is uh, stochastic resetting. And uh, so, you know, the, the, the subject is relatively young in statistical physics, about 12 years uh, old, uh, approximately. And, uh, and I mean, 12 years back, it was introduced into the physics community. And, but since then, you know, the subject has really developed in many different directions, both theoretically and experimentally. And going beyond statistical physics, I mean, now it has been applied in chemistry, ecology, computer science, and many other areas, diverse areas. So making it a truly, you know, interdisciplinary subject. So, so what I'll do today is today's colloquium is that I want to, you know, give you an sort of overview of these recent developments and uh, keeping the level of the talk very pedagogical so that it's accessible to students. And uh, also, you know, please feel free to interrupt me anytime if you don't follow anything. And uh, so I just wanted to tell you, you know, how this, uh, you know, field came about, or the main motivation, and then, uh, then you know, slowly uh, go uh, with uh, time about different questions and what is sort of of basic interest to people. Okay. So, okay. so just a moment. So I also yeah. advertising that this is a colloquium is about one and a half hour long. Uh, yes. 
uh, in a talk. So right. I think the, I, the audience, anytime interrupt the- uh, Sure, the sure, definitely. Please feel free to interrupt anytime. Yeah, yeah. And yes, uh, no, I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So sure. I expect that uh, the audience uh, uh, actively participate in this. Yeah, yeah. That that's 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 the best. That's the best. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Please feel free. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah. So, okay. So so here is the uh, here is the plan of my talk. So I'll first tell you the motivation which uh, led to the studies of this uh, subject, uh, stochastic resetting, and. Uh, and after this brief motivation, so then I'll talk about a very, very simple model, which you can understand very easily. So this is just a single particle diffusing and, you know, how resetting affects its uh, statistical properties uh, and how it leads to a new non-equilibrium st steady state uh, and also with very unusual relaxation towards the steady state. So after we have understood this, then I'll come to the generalization to many body systems with or without interactions. Uh, and, and this is a sort of new non-equilibrium many body uh, steady state. I want to talk about that. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, I will talk about the search problem, which was the original motivation for stochastic resetting. And uh, so this includes first passage properties, you know, how, you know, the, you know, normally if you have a target and if you have a searcher, then, uh, you know, the searcher tries to find the target in minimum time, as minimum as possible. And how stochastic resetting actually helps uh, to minimize this search time. So that, that's uh, sort of main motivation. And I'll come to this uh, first passage problem, but that was much, that will be much later. And then we'll see that there's a sort of, you know, optimal resetting rate that makes this, uh, you know, the search process very efficient. Uh, and this has almost become a paradigm now. And, uh, and I'll tell you uh, some examples of that. And then I'll talk about the recent experiments using optical tweezers, uh, uh, which have verified some of the, uh, uh, theoretical predictions, but also have led to new interesting questions, and I will talk about that. And uh, finally, I'll talk about some recent directions and open questions, and and then uh, summarize and conclude. So I should say right at the beginning that you know, this field has seen so much development in the last uh, 12 years. There have been thousands of papers written, and so I will not be able to cite all the papers, obviously. And uh, so I apologize to people whom I cannot cite uh, right in the beginning is a disclaimer. And uh, but uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, you know, um, you will uh, you will understand that. OK. So so let's start with the motivation that what is, you know, why? Why is uh, one interested in stochastic resetting and what is it? OK, so the motivation up for behind this subject actually comes from search processes. So as you know that the search problems are ubiquitous in nature. So for example, I mean, you can have animals searching for food or for example, after a shipwreck, a helicopter is searching for the survivors uh, and uh, or even in biology, like, uh, you know, a protein searching for a site to bind on a DNA. And even more mundane thing in computer debugging, like you know, if you, when you have written a computer program and you want to find a bug, uh, so how do you search for the bug? Okay, so so all these you know search problems are you know everywhere. I mean in everyday life you are you know so you lost your key or you are looking for something. I mean uh, you know so such problems are ubiquitous. Now in many of these search problems, I mean it's quite natural. I mean you know very intuitive that you know if you have searched for a while uh, without finding the target, then perhaps you should go back and restart the search, go back to your initial position and restart the search, okay? So now why do we say this? I mean, you know, because, you know, often it happens that, you know, you, like, you know, for, for instance, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're uh, you know, writing a computer program, maybe it's a good idea that, you know, if you have not found the bug for a while and you are lost in routines, subroutines and blah, 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 then you just take a break, go for a coffee, come back and restart the whole thing. And then the chances are that you might find the target easily. And the rationale behind this is that, you know, when you restart the process, you might find, you might explore the possible space in a different trajectory. And uh, so a new pathway, and that might help to find the target more easily. Okay, so this, this is the general idea uh, behind. Uh, so, so basically the main point is that it's, you know, intuitively people, you know, sort of uh, knew this and it was known empirically for quite some time that it actually helps. Okay, you, you come back and after some random time, you come back to the starting point instead of continuing the search and then, you know, and then do uh, restart the search. Okay, 
And so this was the sort of uh, main um, idea behind stochastic resetting. Now the question is whether it, it really improves the search time or not. Okay. So let me give you some other examples. Uh, so for instance, if you are looking for a face of a friend in a big crowd like this, uh, in this picture, I mean, how do our eyes search for the face? Okay. So it never, you know, it never sort of scans from one end to the other end. What it does is, is that, you know, your eye just, you know, settles on, you know, some random uh, face here and then looks, you know, search for it locally and does a kind of diffusion, random walk, uh, and it doesn't find, and then it comes back here, and then again it restarts and go by a different trajectory and comes back and so on. <laughs> so it always does this. In fact, psychologists, they do the experiments. Uh, so what they do is, uh, so this is a visual search. So what they do is they show the patient a big board with uh, the letters, and the, all the letters are same, P, 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 et cetera, except that there is one B, in, hidden inside this P. And they ask the patient to look for this letter B. And what they do is they fit a camera in the eye and they look how the, you know, the, what is the trajectory, how the eye searches for this B. Okay. So, I mean, if you have not figured out the B is here actually. So, uh, and then what you see, I mean, this is a schematic picture. What you see is that, you know, you start from a random point here and then you just do sort of random walk. Okay. You don't find it. You come back here the starting point and then you restart a new trajectory then you go like this and you come back and so on okay so this is again you know people observe this uh, in the in this uh, visual search uh, experiments uh, and that that this is how you know naturally we do resetting basically and uh, so there is other example which is mainly from uh, you know computer science uh, or algorithm pro computer algorithm programs something I like simulated handling or something so so imagine that you have a you know very high energy landscape so for example in spin glass or many other disordered systems so this is you know you can think of this is the you know configuration space and this is the energy or free energy if you like uh, and uh, so you know depending on the con configuration so each point on this surface is a you know represents a configuration in the energy of the configuration okay so some configurations have high energy some configurations have low energy and you want to find out the ground state which has the lowest energy which is this guy here so this is the global minimum of your energy landscape so so what you do is you know you start from any given configuration and do some local dynamics for example in the ising model with simulated handling what you do is you just flip a local spin and uh, make, make this local move, which means that you move from one configuration to somewhere close by. And, uh, and you accept it if it reduces the energy and you don't accept it if it, uh, you know, if it increases the energy, if you're, near, if you're at low temperature. But then the problem is that, uh, you know, once you, you know, so you follow a trajectory by simulated handling, but then the chances are that you might get stuck in a local minimum for a very long time. Okay, then you can keep on moving, but you don't, don't get out of this if the temperature is low. So, so then what people empirically used to do always is that, you know, by hand, you know, you go back to the starting configuration and again, you restart your dynamics, a different stochastic dynamics. So, and the rationale, as I said, is that this time you might follow a different pathway like this. And, you know, you might find the global minimum much more easily rather than getting stuck in a local minimum. Okay. So this is the, you know, sort of a simple way to get out of a metastable configuration if you are, you know, uh, without using uh, high temperature or anything. Okay, so just by stochastic resetting. So, so this is the, so these are the general ideas. So this idea of this, uh, in the fact that this stochastic resetting may help the search process uh, to find a target, it has been around empirically for for a long time. But you know, it, there was never any quantitative estimate uh, of uh, you know how much does it improve? Does it really improve, uh, or how much, or is there any optimal? A resetting uh, probability or rate, uh, which might, uh, you know, make the search process more efficient. So these are the questions which motivated us about 12 years back. And uh, so with Martin Evans, uh, my colleague from uh, Edinburgh University, so we decided to, you know, uh, address this problem just within a very simple model to understand. Could I, I mean, could, I, could I ask a simple question? Please, uh, please. What, what you mean by resetting is that there is an origin in the problem and you come back to the origin? Yes, or yes. Is, so is I, that there is, you make a jump to some arbitrary point and- you No, know, you can make an, you can, you can make a jump to an arbitrary point. I mean, I'll come to the, come back to, these are more generalized things. But I think the simplest thing 
is to actually go back to your initial, initial configuration. Okay. Which and I, I'll come back to that. You can, of course, do all kinds of resetting. You know, the point you are resetting to can have a random distribution. And that also people have studied. But uh, the simplest thing is that you go back to your initial configuration. So uh, let me so just... So yeah, you make you, you make the assumption that basically that this point is going back to that very point is more efficient than going back to the random point. No, no, so, no, I, no, I have not gone. Please let me uh, go forward because you will you will realize. I mean, the point is that you can ask that you know, okay, suppose I go back to the initial point. That's my zeroth order model. Okay, after that you can say that okay, so now if I you know give a distribution to the resetting position. In fact, I mean when I talk about experiments, I'll come to that. So then you can ask what happens. Does it make more efficient or less efficient? You can ask all kinds of questions. But to start with, you know, you always start with the simplest model, right? So simplest model, you go back to your initial point. Okay. 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 Thank you. So let me let me describe the simplest model because once I discuss this model, I think it will be much more clear exactly what I mean precisely. Okay. So this model was introduced about 12 years back. This was the sort of first model in this field. And so let me just discuss this model very simply. So, so imagine that you have a Brownian motion, okay? In And for simplicity, I'll just start with one dimension. Again, you can generalize and study it in higher dimension, but to start with, let's start just in one dimension, okay? So imagine that, you know, you, you start your Brownian motion at some initial position. So here, horizontal axis is the space and vertical axis is the time. So you start at some position x0, okay? And you, you have a, just a Brownian motion. So it, this is the trajectory of the Brownian motion. And then what happens is that at some random time, okay, which is distributed by exponentially, like with a with a parameter r. So r is like you know the rate of resetting, if you like. With this probability, with this rate, you go back to your initial position. So this is the arrow which shows this rate arrow with rate r. And then again you do free diffusion. Free diffusion again at after a random exponentially distributed time, you again reset to the initial position. And then again, you go and again, you reset and so on. Okay, So this is called Poissonian resetting because I'm choosing this distribution of the interval from an exponential distribution with rate r. So this is, r is the only parameter in my model. Okay, So more precisely, if you are doing simulations, so here is the dynamics. So you are doing simulation in continuous time. So which means that you, know, you just choose a little small time interval delta t. And in this time interval delta t, with probability r delta t, you go back, you update your position to x0, to the initial position. So r is the rate of resetting, and r delta t is the probability of resetting in time delta t. And with the complementary probability, 1 minus r delta t, you just you know do diffusion. That means you add from your initial position, you just add a random noise, eta t delta t. And this eta t is just a Gaussian white noise. Okay. So if r is 0, you don't have this move. You just have a plain normal Brownian diffusion. Okay, And d is the diffusion constant. And uh, so now the question is that if I now introduce this resetting, I just, you know, dynamically, I'm just, you know, pushing this particle towards this initial position x naught. And I can ask first, first, before even coming to the question of search and all these things, I just ask what happens, you know, just with this simple, you know, introduction of this resetting rate, what happens to the probability distribution of the particle? Okay, So that's the first question I want to ask. So... <clears throat> So I have, you know, in my initial position was that at time zero, I was at X naught, so it's a delta function. And I want to know what is the probability distribution that the particle is at X at time T. Okay, simple question first. Okay. So again, let's re recall that when R is zero and there is no resetting, you have plane diffusion. So in the case of plane diffusion, we all know that the probability distribution of the particle position is just a Gaussian centered at x0, so x minus x0 squared by 4 dt divided by 1 over square root of 4 pi dt. D is the diffusion constant. So this is the exact, you know, the position of the particle after time t, or position distribution of the particle after time t without resetting. And now I ask the question that I introduce this parameter r, which is positive. So how does this probability distribution change in the presence of resetting? Okay. So that's the first question you ask, okay, before before even asking for target and search problems, okay, because, you know, I, we'd like to go step by step, you know, just to start from a basic model and see what happens, okay. So, so what happens? So this is the first question I want to address, and you will see already that there's very, it's quite interesting 
the uh, the distribution. So first of all, I want to mention that you know when R is zero, there is no stationary state. You know this this distribution depends on time forever. I mean always. So only it's a Gaussian and with the, with the width which spreads like square root of t with time. So this is a standard diffusion, but it never becomes time independent. And what we'll see that with resetting, actually at long times, it goes to a stationary state or steady state. Okay, so we'll see that. To see that, so how do we proceed? So we want to write down, I mean, when you solve the, you know, without resetting, you write down the Fokker-Planck equation for the P, P0 of xt, and it satisfies diffusion equation, and the solution is, is just this Gaussian. So I want to write an analogous Fokker-Planck equation in the presence of resetting. So how do we write this? Very simple. So let me explain this. It's, it's not, it's the only technical thing, but it's not, it's not too technical. So basically what happens is that it, this is a master equation. So you see that del P del T is, uh, so there is a diffusion term, okay, which is this guy, del, del X square PR of XT. And then from a given position X, with rate r, you are going away to the initial position. So there is a loss term from x p r from x, uh, and this is just you have to be at the pro, at x, and then with rate r you are going away. So this is a loss term, and that should be a gain term because if you are somewhere else, okay. The gain term, of course, gain term you gain only if you are located exactly at the initial position x naught because by resetting you are coming back to x naught, okay. And so if I start from any other position, say x prime at time t, and from that position with rate r, I can come back to x naught, okay? So if I'm at x naught, that's the delta function, and this is the incoming term from other positions, and I have to sum over all possible positions because it comes from anywhere else by resetting to x naught, okay? So the point is that, I mean, this question that was asked uh, just briefly, I mean, before, that if you reset to some other arbitrary position, all you have to have, you know, this is just a Green's function, delta fun instead of delta function, you have just some P of, uh, you know, X, X0, DX0, you know, you can reset to any arbitrary random position with introducing a resetting position distribution. So if you like, this is just a Green's function of these more general resetting positions, okay? All right. So, Okay, so now first simplification that occurs that you, you realize that this is, and you can check that this, of course, probability distribution is conserved. I mean, integral of PR of XT uh, is always one uh, as in the initial condition. So therefore, this simplification is that this term here is one, okay? So, so that already simplifies, uh, so using the normalization. And so you have just, uh, just a simple linear equation like this with a source term, which is like a delta function of X minus X naught, okay? So how do you solve it? So it's very simple. So you just take a Fourier transform. It's a linear equation. You can take a Fourier transform with respect to x, and you can take a uh, Laplace transform with respect to time, and then you can just solve it. You know, it's it's, it's very trivial exercise almost. Okay, and then you can invert this Fourier invert uh, Fourier transform and the Laplace transform, and you can get write down the solution explicitly. Okay, so let me write show you the solution, and it's it's, it's very simple to write this write down the solution. So the solution is the following, following. At any time t, you know, you can write the explicit solution as the as the sum of two terms. So the first term is e to the power minus rt into p0 of xt. p0 of xt is just this Gaussian here. Okay? And then there's a term which is integral 0 to t, d tau r e to the power minus r tau and p0 of x tau. You can check that this, so, uh, this solution actually satisfies your differential equation with uh, with the correct initial condition and boundary conditions. Okay, so this is just an integral representation of the solution, if you like. But this has a very nice physical interpretation, and this is very general. So you don't have to write all the time for different problems, what is the, you know, Fokker-Planck equation and so on, but you can actually write down a renewal equation directly. And this is, uh, the, so let me just interpret this equation, physical interpretation of this equation, okay? So this is a renewal interpretation. So what does it mean? So again, I look at my trajectory. So this is space, this is time. It starts at x naught, and I'm looking at at time t, and I'm asking what is the probability that the particle arrives at x at time t, starting from x naught? Okay. So what can happen? So first possibility. So for first term, let me understand the first term first. So first term. So you can ask. You know, there's a possibility that there is no resetting at all in time t, right? So if there's no resetting, 
this particle just moves diffusively and arrives at x. So the probability for that event is P0 of xt. But this happens provided there is no resetting between 0 to t. And what is the probability that there is no resetting between 0 to t? This is just e to the power minus rt. Because you are, you know, with probability r delta t, 1 minus r delta t is the, the probability of no resetting. So if you, you know, if you just take the uh, limit, a uh, large number of these things. So basically the interval is, uh, you know, exponential distribution. So therefore the probability that there is no resetting, that means resetting happens after time t. So you have to integrate r e to the power minus r t integrated from t to infinity and that gives you e to the power minus r t. It's just a probability that there is no resetting. Okay. So this is one possibility when there is no zero resetting between zero to t. Now, other possibility is that you have one or more resettings in time t. So how do you solve that, this multiple resetting case? So it's very simple, actually. And this is the key idea. So the idea is that you, you look at, you know, from time t, you go backwards, and you look at the time at which the last resetting happened before time t. Okay. Now, if that happens, then you, if you can look at that time, then you see that, you know, let's say this is the tau, time tau. Okay. Then the point is that from because you are resetting the x naught, so from here to here, free diffusion, which happens with probability p zero of x tau, which is just free diffusion. Okay, but then you have to ensure that there is no resetting. You don't care what happened before. Only only thing that you have to uh, take care is that there is no resetting between you know during this time interval tau followed by one resetting event, and probability distribution of this interval is just r e to the power minus r tau, okay, as we said. And then you have to integrate over all possible tau from 0 to t, okay. That takes care of the multiple resetting things, okay. So, there's a, so this is the, you know, simple phys counting physical interpretation of the exact result, okay. And this is very general, okay. I mean, no matter, you know, if you don't have exponential distribution, if you have something else, you can just put that some, some p of tau, and in general, this will be true, okay. So this is actually very nice, this renewal interpretation. And because once you have this explicit solution, then actually you can see what happens now in the long time limit. Because in the long time limit, so this term, first term drops out, okay, because of e to the power minus rt. And the second term, you can just put zero to infinity. And if the integral exists, that sales tells you that there is a stationary state, okay? So indeed, if you just put zero to infinity, and uh, you just substitute the Gaussian here and you can do the integral explicitly and it's very simple. And what you find is that indeed there is a time dependent, time independent stationary state in the long time limit. And it has a very simple structure. It's just an exponential distribution. It's non-Gaussian. It's an exponential distribution centered at x minus x naught, both sides exponential. I'll show you a picture in a minute. With a constant here, alpha naught, which is square root of r over d. Remember, r is the resetting rate and d is the diffusion constant. Okay. So this is the first, you know, sort of interesting thing that with resetting that you actually, you know, you arrive at a not, you know, a stationary state, whereas without resetting, you do not have any stationary state. Okay. So how does it look like? So if you look at this solution here, as I said, if you plot it, so as you know, as I said, it's a double exponential. So it's a symmetric distribution centered at x naught. It falls off exponentially on either side with a decay rate one over alpha naught, and alpha naught is the square root of r over d. Okay. Now the point is that this is a steady state, but this is a non-equilibrium steady state. Why is it a non-equilibrium steady state? Because you know what does what do we mean by non-equilibrium steady state? So non-equilibrium steady state means that you know I mean you have a stochastic dynamics and you have different configurations, and you look at it in the configuration space, and so if there is a non-zero current flowing in the configuration space in the stationary state at the long time limit, then we say this is a non-equilibrium stationary state. If the current is zero across any loop, if you like, uh, then it's an equilibrium stationary state. So that's the basic definition, the difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium stationary states. And what happens here is that because of the resetting move, you see your configurations are now labeled by the position X. Uh, so in the long time limit, so you can actually go away from a point x by resetting to x naught, but you cannot come back, okay? So obviously, you know, there is a current from x to x naught, but not the reverse current x naught to x, okay? So that breaks the detailed balance. Uh, and 
makes the makes a non-zero current in the configuration space. And that's why it's a non-equilibrium steady state as opposed to equilibrium steady state like a Ising model or something where we have uh, you know thermal equilibrium here and zero current in the stationary state, but in the configuration space. But uh, here you have a non-zero probability current and that's why we have a non-equilibrium stationary state. And this is a very simple mechanism to generate such a non-equilibrium stationary state. You know, you just introduce this resetting, that's it. You know, essentially what it, and now, now you might think that, okay, I mean, this, this guy, you know, it looks like there's an effective potential here. It looks like an equilibrium configuration state, Gibbs state, with an effective potential, which is this, uh, you know, the linear potential mod X minus X naught, okay. Yes, it does look like a Gibbs state uh, with an effective potential, but again, as I said, it's a non-equilibrium state because there is a non-zero current in the probability space, uh, uh, configuration space. Uh, and um, so it's not it's a non-equilibrium stationary state and uh, and uh, and this effective potential you can understand where where it comes from because you know you are dynamically always you know forcing the particle to go back to its initial position so it generates a dynamically effective potential so the you know the potential essentially gets confined or localized around x naught and that's why you get this uh, the uh, the stationary state okay so this was the our theoretical prediction 12 years back and, and then elementary question Sorry. Why well, elementary question? Why is current carrying flowing? So yes. when when come when particle diffuse diffusive motion then yes. come back to the no, original when, position. Yeah. Yes. When you do then, plane diffusion, when you do plane diffusion, you can go from one point to another point and you can come back from that point. Okay. By diffusion. But yeah. by the resetting move, you know, resetting move by itself, you are resetting from one point to another, but not the reverse. We're always going back to X naught, right? Why? The yeah. diffusion allows backward. No, no, backward yeah. no, no, diffusion can allow by local, by, you know, by, but it's not one step. I mean, as I said, you know, in the configuration space, you have to ensure that probability current is zero for every possible moves, every possible loops. So you can go by resetting from one point to another and come back there by diffusion. But that's not... Uh, you know, that's not the uh, detail balance zero. The detail balance means by the same move, same probability, you have to come back. But that you cannot do. Okay. So that is why the current is non-zero. Okay. Thank you. And, okay. So this is the, so this was the theoretical prediction. And, uh, and more recently, uh, so in this from the group of uh, E.L. Roikman at Tel Aviv University, so they verified this prediction experimentally in uh, using holographic optical tweezers. And you see these, uh, you know, these dots here are the experimental, experimental results. And the, the, you know, the dotted and the, the, the dotted blue line is our theoretical prediction. And it works uh, beautifully. And I'll come back to the experiments uh, later on. I mean, all right. So this was the, you know, the, the uh, first very, sim very simple model. Okay, so now I've talked about the steady state. So you can say, how does it relax to the stationary state? You know, that's a standard question in non-equilibrium statistical physics that, you know, uh, first of all, you have a non-equilibrium steady state, but you can also ask interesting question to ask, you know, how does it relax to the steady state okay, with time? So, and here it's a very unusual temporal relaxation. Again, we can understand in terms of this very simple model. I have told you that we have this exact solution here, okay? So all you have to do, you know, just plot this function and uh, see how it relaxes in time t and just analyze this and this on you have to analyze it not just putting t equal to infinity but t to be large and when you put t to be large you can actually do the integral explicitly even for large t but you know simplest way to proceed is to do a saddle point uh, in evaluation of this integral because at large time you can neglect the left term first term but just in you know evaluate this integral by saddle point and i'll just tell you what the results are so results are actually very interesting. So what happens here is that what you find, so this is again, this is a space and on the horizontal axis and time in the vertical axis. And so what you find is that there is a light cone here. So this is at late times. So at late times, what happens is that if I, you know, if I you know, going along space, I'm just looking at my PR of X T at late times T, not infinite time, not in the stationary state, but at late time T as a function of X, okay. So what happens is that as long as x is between x minus x naught, uh, you know, from the initial position, the distance from the initial position is less than some time-dependent length psi t, and this time-dependent length 
increases ballistically linearly with time t with this prefactor here, square root of 4 dr. So this is this light cone here, if you like. Okay. So if you're inside the light cone, that means if your x minus x naught is less than psi of t, then what happens, which is this purple region, what happens is that for every x in this along this line here within the purple region, it becomes time independent. That means for these positions, the, the probability distribution has become time independent, essentially. However, if you cross this line, if you are outside this light cone, this green region, so there, you know, it still depends on time t. Okay. So, so there is a kind of transition from the stationary regime to the to the non-stationary regime, if you like, for a finite but large t. And uh, this is sort of very unusual because it says that you know some regions of your space, you know, the, the, the relaxation is very non-uniform. It's space dependent. Some regions of space have already relaxed to the stationary state, but the other regions outside this light cone, they are yet to relax to the stationary state. So there's still you know activity going on there. Okay. So 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 basically what happens here is that the this non-equilibrium stationary state, NES, it gets it gets established on a larger and larger length scale. I mean, because as time grows, this light cone grows. So the stationary regime is getting bigger and bigger. And finally, of course, everything becomes purple, everything becomes stationary. But at a finite but large time, you know, you have a you know, very sharp transition from a stationary regime to a non-stationary regime, okay? And, uh, and we'll see in a minute that this is actually a dynamical phase transition. And uh, so this is very unusual because you know usually typically when we look at the any 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 model when you study the relaxation, so what you see is that there is a typical largest eigenvalue of the relaxation matrix, which uh, you know which go governs the relaxation to the uh, uniformly to the stationary state in the whole system. But here it, it doesn't do that. You know here it's a, the relaxation is a very different because there's no not one single exponentially decreasing eigenvalue e to the power minus lambda t or something, but you know it, it depends very much on the space okay so so how so how so i mean to, to we wanted to understand as you go from you know the purple to green regime as you cross this line you know is there a phase transition or is just a crossover and whatnot so for that we, we need to study you know we need to set x to close to this uh, square root of 4 drt and make a small expansion around it and you know study the behavior there at late times and if you do that you find that it has a nice large deviation form. So it, it actually, the probability distribution, you can write in terms of, in the following way. So it's exponential minus t into some function i of this, uh, you know, speed, basically, x minus x naught over t, okay? So, 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 and so the shape of this function tells me what happens here. I mean, as I go from left to right, okay? So, and in fact, you can compute this function explicitly. From, from the formula that I showed you. And it turns out that this, this it's called the rate function in the large division literature. So this is i of y, this function, is actually just a linear function mod y, okay, mod y, as long as y is less than this critical point square root of 4dr. Square root of 4dr is just the speed of this light cone, okay. So that means, you know, if the argument is less than this, then essentially the t cancels out and you get a stationary state because if it is linear, t cancels out and you get the stationary state. But if it is bigger than this, uh, this critical point here, uh, this, this light cone point, then it actually still depends on time in a non-trivial way. And the large deviation function is uh, you know, parabolic. So it's, it has a linear here and then it changes to a parabolic shape. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that and uh, this function, but you can plot it very easily. And in fact, what you see is that the, if you take the second derivative of this function, okay, so second derivative is actually discontinuous at this critical point y star. And this is typically a signature of a dynamical phase transition because like in equilibrium statistical mechanics, if you look at the free energy as a function of some parameter like temperature, then you know when you have, when you have a phase transition, usually some derivatives of this free energy becomes uh, you know non-analytic or discontinuous. Uh, I mean, uh, so, uh, so here, analogously here, you don't have a free energy, it's a non-equilibrium stationary state, uh, non-equilibrium uh, problem. So here, instead, this rate function here, it plays the role analogous to free energy. And uh, so the second order discontinuity of the rate function means there's a second order dynamical phase transition in this, uh, in this problem, in the relaxation. 
So to summarize, I mean, what you see is that in this very, very simple model, okay, without even, you know, I'm not even gone to the target search yet, you know, just to understand the basic model that, you know, that it has a very rich, uh, both static, that means you know, stationary, as well as unusual, you know, temporal behavior. And so this was already quite encouraging. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so this was the starting point, essentially. And before I go to the search problem, I'll come back to the search problem by this diffusive search later on. But before I go there, so let us see, you know, I mean, this is a single particle case, but you can actually easily generalize this general concept to many body systems, okay? And uh, and there have been, you know, quite a few work. I mean, one of the earlier works was by Hung Yu Park, uh, a long time back with uh, multi hankel and uh, and uh, and also uh, i forgot his name is uh, so so the, it was a very nice piece of work and uh, indeed in looked at the reaction diffusion systems in the presence of resetting so but the idea main idea of many generalizing to many body system is the following so generalization to many body system so what is so so now i can you know just tell you, you know, what is the basic idea behind stochastic resetting so I, I give you an example of a single Brownian motion resetting, but you can say that this can be, I can do it for any stochastic process. It doesn't have to be Brownian motion, okay? So I can start, so basically the main idea is that you have any process, X of T. In fact, it doesn't have to have a stochastic process. It can be any deterministic process also, okay? And it can represent just a single particle or a multi-particle process, whatever, any process, okay? You start from the initial position, uh, initial value of this, uh, you know, the, the, the process, and then you evolve by its natural dynamics. And these natural dynamics can be, you know, diffusion, can be whatever, I mean, you want. And I'll give you some examples later. And you evolve it. Uh, and then at some random time, you know, T1, let's say, epoch, random epoch, you just, you know, with some, you know, I mean, you go back to the initial state. Uh, and then again, you evolve by natural dynamics. And then again, after a random time, at some random epoch, T2, you go back to the initial position, initial uh, 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 position. Uh, and then again, you do and keep on the, and you choose these intervals from some distribution P of tau, which doesn't have to be exponential. For the exponential case, this is just a Poissonian resetting that I mentioned. And again, you know, this process here can be anything. It doesn't have to be diffusion. It can be whatever your favorite problem is, okay? I mean, uh, if you have any problem, you just introduce resetting and that and that drives it into a non-equilibrium state, in, in non-trivial non-equilibrium stationary state. Okay, so this is the sort of general idea that the, you interrupt the free evolution at random times and uh, go back to the starting point, and again you evolve, and then at long times it it gets into a state which is typically you know uh, independent of time, and this and there are some examples where it, you may not reach the non-equilibrium stationary state, but in most cases that you reach the non-equilibrium stationary state. Okay. So let me just give you some examples of many body system now. So I discussed two examples that I find very uh, interesting. So as I said, you know, co to consider any many body system uh, with interaction evolving under its own stochastic dynamics. Uh, and uh, and so for example, you can take a fluctuating interface uh, like a uh, Carter Paris Zhang interface uh, or uh, you know uh, any other model, Edward Wilkinson's model, or you can take Ising model with global dynamics. Uh, these are your natural dynamics, okay? And now you subject them to resetting to the initial configuration at the constant rate R. I mean, for simplicity, I consider Poissonian resetting, okay? And then you ask what happens, okay? So again, you know, the general idea, so, so you have this configuration. So for example, if you are looking at fluctuating interfaces, your basic degrees of freedom are the heights of the interface, uh, let's say between liquid and vapor, I mean, uh, uh, at different space points, okay? So I'm just, just you know, for illustration, I'm just thinking of it on a lattice, uh, that height one, H1, H2, HC, et cetera. So this is your configuration. So this is like a one plus one dimensional KPZ interface. So it has its own interfacial dynamics, KPZ equation or Edwards Wilkinson's equation. Evolve it with these dynamics up to a random time. And then you just reset, go back to the initial configuration, the whole configuration. And then again, you evolve it and again, you go back. And if you do it repeatedly like this random resetting, you reach a stationary state. And same thing in the Ising model. The Ising model, you know, think of uh, Ising model in two dimension. You have the spins on different lattice sites. Uh, you have L spins. Uh, and uh, with some interaction, and you have a global dynamics or Kawasaki dynamics, whatever you want. And you have, this is your natural dynamics. And again, you interrupt at random times and go back to the starting configuration and again, evolve it. So, but when you, when you reset, you reset the whole configuration, okay? So you ask what happens, okay? So again, you know, the idea of, uh, 
you know, the general idea of the renewal process applies here for many body system as well. So the main idea is again, the following. So I can, you know, write down exactly in the same way that I write, wrote down in the simple model of diffusion that I explained to you before. So let's say PRCT. So this is the probability distribution to be in the configuration C at time T in the presence of resetting with rate R. And P of zero means the same, but without resetting. Okay. So this is the natural dynamics. So again, you know, I can write down without even solving the problem. I can write down this renewal equation. So the first term, again, if up, I'm looking at up at time t, so up to time t, if there is no resetting event, which occurs with probability to the power minus rt, I have a natural evolution, free evolution, which is p0 of c of t. Okay. And if you have multiple resetting, so one or more, then again, you look back here in, from time t, you go back to the uh, to the time when the last resetting happened and say tau is that time and uh, you know tau is the time since the last resetting and then you know between during this time interval tau from the last resetting to the current time this is just a free evolution so again it's, you have p0 of c of tau and then you have to integrate of tau 0 to t so this is an exact equation for the time evolution of any problem with resetting so if you know the the uh, the probability distribution if you know the dynamics of your problem without resetting okay but you have to know it at all time t and uh, and then you just have to you know just uh, you plug in this equation and then you know what happens in the resetting and in particular you see that in the long time limit again i can drop the first term and you can just become uh, zero to infinity and if this integral exists then you have a non equilibrium stationary state okay but the the non trivial thing is that you know for calculation that you need to know uh, the probability distribution of the free problem at all time tau because you need to do this integral and not just at late times okay because many many problems i mean we know the, the evolution you know probability distribution at some you know at late times but here to calculate the stationary state you need at all times and then do the perform this integral which is just a laplace transform with respect to time tau of this uh, probability distribution uh, configuration without resetting okay so, yes, please. Yeah, sure. Just a concept of this uh, generalization. So, the here then the resetting means that the resetting state means that the original, the initial configuration state means the resetting state. Yes, exactly. You start your original configuration, whatever it is. So, in the Brownian diffusion, original configuration was x0, just a single party. Yeah, so, it's, yeah, it was yeah. its initial position. Yeah. But here, let's say for Ising model, you have the all spins. So, let's say you start with the initial configuration when you have, you know, let's say all the spins are up. Okay. And then you do your dynamics. So, then after random time, you go back again to the all spins up. So, the same configuration that you started out with. I see. Okay. Then... It, 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 is there a physical realization how to reset that kind of many part? Many yes, parts? yes, in, indeed. I mean, I, I, I'll show you some examples. I mean, indeed, there are, there are physical relations. In fact, I mean, for example, I mean, you know, in optical trap, when uh, people do that, what they do is that they, they take uh, many particles, okay, uh, many particles inside the trap, uh, you, know, you know, harmonic trap, let's say. And so what happens is that, you know, you switch off the trap, you let the particles diffuse, and at some random time, you switch uh -huh. on the trap. So then, you know, basically, all the particles basically go back to their okay, uh, initial okay. positions. Then it makes sense. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. So, so let me just give you some. So basically, what, so this is, a, so this is a, so what we call is, a, you know, this non, non equilibrium stationary state. It therefore, you know, it's like a new ensemble. We call it resetting ensemble. So what is this ensemble? So this non equilibrium stationary state, which is PRC, so this is a zero to infinity of this guy here, okay? So this has, a, again, you know, very simple, you can interpret this this way in the following way. Once you have this result, you can interpret it the following way, that this is your, you know, uh, the stationary state measure. And if you want to calculate any observable, you know, for example, observable O in this stationary state, so you take an expectation value of that with of this in this stationary state. So this means that you have to just compute the expectation value of that operator at time t, without resetting in the original dynamical ensemble. And, and then you just have to take the Laplace transform of that, okay? So this means physically what it means is that imagine that you, you have an original system without resetting, okay? So you draw, you know, infinitely many copies of your origin, original system. And then, you know, each copy, each, uh, you know, the configuration, each copy, you evolve it 
up to a random time. Okay, so evolve it up to a random time, distributed exponentially, and then you average over all evolved copies of the ensemble because that's what we are doing, right? So you are you are doing the original um, uh, ensemble, but at time tau basically, and then you are saying that okay, this tau itself is a random variable drawn from exponential distribution. Okay, so so it's, a, it's very simple actually. So all you have to do is to you know original model. Whatever, if you can calculate it at time tau, you just think of this tau as itself is a random variable drawn from an exponential distribution. Okay, so that's the idea, and uh, and uh, so so the so now I'll show you some results for Ising model. I mean, uh, just a very simple, uh, and you will see that the resetting introdu introducing resetting actually leads to a new sort of non-equilibrium st steady state, which is quite richer compared to the equilibrium um, state of uh, Ising model. Uh, which is without resetting. So, so I have two parameters now in the Ising model. Think of this temperature T and uh, resetting rate R. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what happens without resetting? I recall you, re remind, remind you. So, all of us know in Ising model. So, if I take 2D Ising model, so there is a, this, this is the temperature. And so, there's a critical temperature Tc. So, below which you have a ferromagnetic state and above which you have paramagnetic state. So, this simply means that if I'm looking at the distribution of the magnetization, okay. Magnetization means local spin, basically. Uh, so uh, distribution of the magnetization. Then in the stationary state, that is long time, uh, long time limit. If I'm evolving this my system by global dynamics, I'm just looking at the long time, uh, long time uh, limit. So I reach a equilibrium Gibbs Boltzmann state, and in that equilibrium Gibbs Boltzmann state, uh, if I look at the probability distribution of the you know local magnetization, then what happens in the ferromagnetic state? Like if you're at zero temperature. Then if you plot this equilibrium distribution, you see just two delta peaks. One is at a plus M equilibrium, one is at minus M equilibrium, which means that the system is totally ordered and it has a magnetization, which is the equilibrium magnetization, I mean, plus one for rising model, if you like, and uh, and minus one at zero temperature. And as you increase the temperature, you know, they, they, they remain these two delta peaks here, but okay, the value changes from plus one to minus one, it becomes less magnetized. So this is a simple way to detect the ferromagnetic to from the paramagnetic phase because paramagnetic phase, on the other hand, if you look at the same uh, distribution of the magnetization in the stationary state, and what you find is a delta function at m equal to zero. That means you know there, there is um, you know on an average the magnetization is zero and there is no order in the system, long range order in the system, and this is the our usual you know Ising model phase transition that we are familiar with. Okay, and now what I want to ask is that okay I introduce this resetting R another axis, so temperature TR plane. And I want to know what happens to this, uh, this distribution of the magnetization uh, in the TR plane, okay? And I will not go through the details, I'll just show you the phase diagram. It's actually quite interesting. And for and of course, there's a symmetry in this problem. So I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll not plot the left part. I mean, I'll just plot only the right part on both sides, okay? So here is the result to get. So this is the re resetting rate R. And this is the temperature. So at resetting rate zero, you have you know, on this axis you have just uh, you know fer um, uh, ferromagnetic and paramagnetic, uh, as I said. So this is a two delta peaks, and since I'm looking at only the positive side, so there's one delta peak at m equilibrium and one delta peak at m equal to zero. And now I introduce the resetting R, and I ask you know what happens to the magnetization distribution. So what you have now, you have three regions in the phase in the phase diagram. So there's this uh, red vertical line, which is at TC. So there's a left region here, and then there's a crossover line here, this uh, blue dotted line. And there are three phases, one, two, and three. Okay. So, and let me explain to you what happens here. So, so what happens, you know, on the left side, if you are below TC, okay. So this was just a, you know, delta function. If R equal to zero, it was just a delta function. As you increase R, so what happens is that this delta function gets spread out uh, it has it it gets a width here okay in the presence of a finite resetting rate r and but what you see is that the, there is a still a non zero gap between zero and m equal i mean the, this uh, the, the support of this uh, distribution so which means that there is still a long range order okay? so there is a gap in the spectrum which means uh, that they, that this so it's, it's a kind of ferromagnetic phase if you like except that it's no no longer delta function but it has a non trivial distribution here okay but there is still a gap between zero and the starting point of this, so which means that it's a, it's a that's a signature of a long range order basically. Okay. Now let me go to the right of this crossover line. So on the right of the crossover line, again at r equal to zero, you had a delta function at zero here. 
which was the paramagnetic state, and I in increase the resetting rate. Now, delta function at zero means that there is no gap, and that's a signature of a paramagnetic phase, no long range order. So what happens here when you introduce resetting, this de single delta function peak, it gets spread out. It becomes kind of almost exponential here, okay? But still, you know, the, the gap, there is no gap between this spectrum and m equal to zero, which means that this is, there is no long range order here. So this is the analog of uh, paramagnetic phase. It just gets modified a little bit as you increase the R. But then there's a new kind of phase here. It's not a phase really, because it's a crossover between the paramagnetic and this. We, we call this pseudo ferro phase, uh, this region two. So here, what happens is the, again, if I'm looking at the distribution, here. So the distribution now, you know, its typical value is not zero. So it has a you know large value, but it still is gapless. So that means there is no true long range order because it's gapless. But, you know, if you take a typical sample and if you, in the peak of the distribution, the typical value of the magnetization that you'll see is non-zero. Okay. So it has some semblance of ferromagnetic phase, but there is no true long range order. Okay. And, uh, and uh, but it, so, so in that sense, it's like uh, paramagnetic, but it's a mixture of these two phases, if you like. Okay, and you can actually compute exactly into the Ising model this this uh, you know the crossover line, uh, and uh, and and you know you can find out this phase diagram. And of course, it it goes to zero here with a non-trivial exponent that depends continuously on the temperature T and R. But I will not give you the details of this. Okay. So let could me I discuss. Ask, could Sorry, could yeah, I ask please. one question? In, in that situation, the resetting to uh, a given state. Uh, what state are you choosing? Are you choosing? So here, zero, okay, that's yeah, yeah. Zero, so here, zero here okay. state or yeah, yeah. Or so the, this is a random. So I'm quenching. I mean, I'm basically I'm I'm starting from a random initial configuration. Okay, so I choose my is, Ising spins totally randomly. I mean, but I, 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 I know which state it is. I mean, uh, I choose each spin either with probability half, I choose it to be up, probability half, I choose it to be down, and then I reset to that state, okay? Okay, you 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 don't reset to zero, that would otherwise be a bias for the ferromagnet. For exactly, the paramagnet. exactly, for okay. the paramagnetic phase, precisely. Okay, yes. okay, good. So now, uh, so let me just uh, tell you one more example from a very recent example. And this is the, I, I mentioned uh, to you in a minute, uh, it comes from the motivation comes from the optical experiments. Uh, and uh, so here, what we have is, uh, okay, for some reason, I mean, here I put space along the vertical axis and time along the horizontal axis. Uh, so I have a, you know, let's say N Brownian motions and to and simplicity, you know, imagine that they're all independent, okay. So you start from the origin, they all start from the same point origin, and they do they do diffusion, they can cross each other, they're totally independent. And then at some random time, I reset them simultaneously, all of them together to their initial position, zero. Okay. And then I, you know, again evolve them you know, by free diffusion. And again, at random time. So this is exactly mimicking kind of the experiment I mentioned. You know, if you have you know, many particles in the optical trap. I mean, you just, you know, just switch off and switch on the, you know, switch off the optical trap here, let the particles diffuse and then switch on the optical trap. And the optical trap you assume to be very, very narrow. So it almost collapses them to the to their position. And then you go up again and go up down there. Okay. So so they are resetting simultaneously with rate R. So and so first thing that happens, so again, by the same token that I mentioned, that the non-equilibrium stationary state, you can calculate the joint distribution of this, okay, of this position. So this is a many-body state again. And this joint distribution, as before, you know, from a general formula, you see that's in the stationary state, this is R e to the power minus R tau. And here, without resetting, they are independent. So it's just a product of the individual Gaussians. Okay. And here you see something interesting because what you see is that even though you know inside the integral for a fixed tau they are all independent okay so the joint distribution factorizes into individual distribution but when you integrate over this time tau okay that means you evolve them by a random time and then that random time is chosen and you average over this random time drawn from exponential distribution okay in this stationary state you cannot you know once you have done the integral you can no longer factorize this joint distribution okay so which means that the stationary state actually the particles get correlated even though they started out independently and this correlation comes from this simultaneous resetting because you are simultaneously resetting them and so they all go back together 
if you like, to the to the starting point. And this induces a dynamical correlation between them, which persists even at long times and leading to a non-equilibrium stationary state, but with a non-trivial correlation between them. You can calculate the correlation function explicitly. I'll not show you the de details. Uh, and this is actually work done with my graduate student, Marco Biroli, and uh, we collaborated with Hernan Lalande and Gregory Scherer, uh, and this was a recent work. And But what is nice in this model is that even though it's a, it's a non-trivial, you know, uh, correlated, strongly correlated stationary state, because of this structure here, you know, because inside the integral they are independent, many observables you can calculate very easily for independent particles. And then you just have to integrate over this tau parameter. So you think of tau as a parameter, you calculate for independent particles, and then you just average over the uh, the uh, tau essentially from this uh, distribution. And so you can, so you know, in many, many body correlated system to calculate any observable, I'll give you an example of that, a few examples of observables, is very hard to call calculate anything because of the correlations, okay? But you know, here is one example, and there's a whole class of models you can think of this, uh, uh, that you can actually, you know, if you can calculate for independent particles, you just have to average over the, you know, this tau variable, uh, the, the time evolved variable, and then, then you can actually compute exactly. So you get a whole class of solvable models with strong long, long range correlations for which you can calculate many observables exactly. So in this particular example, so for example, I mean, if you, if you look at the average density of particles, which is defined as the number of particles. So here is a typical configuration of the particles on the x-axis. Uh, points denote the particle positions. And you ask, you know, how many particles are there on an average between x and x plus dx, okay? And it's normalized to one, so it's a probability density. And the average density you can easily compute from here. You just have to integrate out the, you know, all the um, n, n minus one guys and just keep one of them to be x. Uh, and you find again this single particle result as you would expect. Uh, and uh, so this is this double exponential that I already showed you. And, but but now you can ask many, several many body questions of this one, one you know, one dig, on this strongly correlated gas. So you can ask, for example, what's the distribution of the rightmost particle? So this is like the distribution of the extreme, extreme value positions of this uh, set of uh, particles. Uh, and typically it goes like square root of log n. And you can ask what's the gap between the first particle and the second particle? What's the distribution of the gap? So this goes like one over square root of log n. And uh, then you can ask what's the gap in the bulk in the bulk of the system because you, you see density high here that means they are you know quite close to each other in the bulk but as you go towards the edge you know to, away from the bulk you know they get sparser and sparser because the density decreases so particles are far apart from each other and in fact you know as I said you know it, in a given sample of finite size n it goes like square root of log n this position here and the gap decreases like one over square root of log n very very slowly okay. But you can calculate many observables, not just the average density. You can calculate the distribution of the kth maximum. This is called the order statistics. Uh, you can calculate the spacing distribution, full counting statistics. So this is, you can calculate for a strongly correlated gas. And these are, you know, very non-trivial calculation, but because of this particular structure of this, it becomes simple. And so here is some example, and the results are quite non-trivial. So on the left, I plot the distribution of the maximum of the, the make position, that means the position of the rightmost particle in the stationary state. And so what you find is that, as I said, you know, the typical position scales like square root of log n. So if you scale this position by square root of log n, you get a non-trivial scaling function, which looks like 2z e to the power minus z squared. So it increases and make, becomes a maximum and then goes to out as a Gaussian that large z. It's a non-trivial function, non-trivial extreme value function uh, for a strongly correlated system. You can calculate the gap distribution, which is shown on the right. Gap typically goes like one over square root of log n, gap between this larger first particle and second particle. And again, it has this non-trivial scaling function, which is given by this integral here. And if you look at the, you know, the tail of this gap distribution, it has a non-exponential tail. It goes like exponential minus z to the power two-thirds, stretched exponential uh, tail here. <laughs> and it doesn't go to zero. That means, you know, the particles, there's no depulsion between particles and they, they are close apart. There's, in fact, this is an attractive gas because the dynamical correlation is putting them closer to each other. And, uh, but but this is, these are all non-trivial, uh, you know, observables that you can compute. So you, this opens up a whole, you know, set of exactly solvable, uh, strongly correlated gas, which is a very interesting out, out, outcome of this uh, problem, okay? 
Okay, so 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 now so far so now I'll go in the last part of my talk and probably I'll have to go a little bit faster here. Uh, so so far I talked about just the stationary state and its different ramifications both for uh, sing, single particle and multi-particle case. And as I said, you know there's a non-equilibrium stationary state and plus there's an unusual temporal correlation. So temporal collisions in many of these many body systems have not been studied yet, and that will be that that's definitely an open problem. So in fact, in for even for Ising model, I mean there are very few studies. I mean there's hardly any study actually. So Ising model, global dynamics, and Euriset. I mean we just looked at the distribution of the magnetization, but you know for example you can ask how does the correlation function behave and things like that. So there are many many open questions. So the field is wide open, and uh, so all the I mean I encourage younger people to to look at some of these problems. Okay. So now I come back to the original motivation, which is the target search problem, okay? First passage properties. Does resetting really help to find the target easily? So I'll now go back to, again, my first example of a single particle diffusion, okay? So let's first see what happens without resetting. So for pure diffusion, if you have pure diffusion, if you start the position at X naught, and imagine that now you have a fixed target at the origin, shown by this red dot, and you ask what's the mean time for the searcher to arrive at the target for the first time. Because the first arrival time or first passage time, so that's like the time to find the target, uh, uh, search time basically. Uh, and when it finds the target, the process, you know, it, 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 it terminates. Uh, and you want to know what's the mean time to find the target. Okay? Now, for ordinary diffusion in one dimension, this is a well-known classical result that this mean time is infinite. And what? how do we see this? So it's very simple to see this. So what you solve the basic quantity to look at to calculate this first passage probability is you calculate the survival probability. You ask, what is the probability? The subscript zero means no resetting. What is the probability that starting at X naught, I do not reach the origin up to time T? That means I stay positive, okay? So this is called the persistence or survival probability of the target up to time T. That means the searcher has not found the target up to time T. So this is the basic object. And this basic object is very easy to show that for pure diffusion, it just, I mean, and here I'm thinking of a backward approach. That means I'm treating the X naught, uh, the initial position as a variable. So, you know, you just see what happens in the first step where you go and then you can write a differential equation for uh, this Q or Q0 of X0 T. And this is just a diffusion equation, treating X naught as a, as, a, as a variable. And X naught has to be positive because you have not found the target yet. So you start, we are from the initial position and initially, uh, and you have to put the absorbing boundary condition because if you start right at the origin, you know, you have already found the target. So the survival probability is zero. So you have to solve a diffusion problem, but with an absorbing boundary condition at the origin. And this is a classic problem. You can find it in any standard textbook in, uh, in um, a stochastic process. And the solution, you can solve this again by, by Laplace transform by usual techniques. And the solution is very simple. So this is the survival probability. So this is the error function, which is the integral of Gaussian zero to x of e to the power minus u squared du of x naught divided by square root of 4d. x naught is the initial position. Okay, so it decreases with time t uh, as one over square root of t. And the, how is the first passage calculated? So first passage is is that basically that means you have to survive. You know, uh, you know if the first passage occurs at time t. Uh, then that means it's just minus time derivative of uh, survival probability because, you know, I mean, survival probability, you can think of this as the integral of the first passage probability from t to infinity because, you know, if you survive up to time t, that means the first passage must occur beyond t. So you have an integral from t to infinity, the cumulative distribution, and you take a the time derivative of that with a negative sign, that gives you the first passage probability. And the first passage probability from this taking derivative is just 1 over t to the power 3 by 2, times c to the power. This is a classic well-known result. Uh, and the main point, uh, the, here t is the random variable. So this is the distribution of the first passage time t. And uh, and it has this power law tail. It decays for large time t as t to the power minus 3 by 2. Okay, So this is in interesting. So what, what it tells you is that it has a fat tail. That means you know there are configurations where it takes a very, very long time to find the particle because it just you know, moves in the opposite direction. Okay. So this is a dichotomous result, right? Because, you know, so it means that, you know, if I take the first moment, therefore the mean of this distribution, because it says t to the power minus three by two, so it's normalizable, this distribution. So when you integrate over t, zero to t, it's one, but its first moment is diverges, it's infinite. Okay, that means the time to find the target on an average is infinite. 
And this is because there are trajectories which go away in the opposite direction. Okay. So, so this is a, you know, this is a typical, you know, paradoxical result because you know one dimensional Brownian motion is recurrent. That means with probability one, it will definitely find the target. If you calculate the capture probability, it's one. You can, this you can see the survival probability in the long time limit, the error function goes to one basically. So that means with probability one, it will definitely uh, it goes to sorry, it goes to zero exactly. So which means that it will definitely find the particle. But the time to find the particle on an average diverges. Okay. So and and this, as I said, is because of these you know, trajectories that move away in the opposite direction. And uh, so 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 now you ask, you know, so there's infinite time to find the particle. So random diffusion is not a very good strategy to find the target. Uh, so now the question is if I introduce resetting. What what does it do? Okay, so the point is that when you have when you int introduce resetting, what it does, it cuts off those wandering trajectories. Okay, and uh, how does it you know occur? And that's what you can you, you want to calculate. So so the computation is again you know again the same idea. I mean, basic idea is very simple, and I'll not go into too much details. But just to you know, I'll go through rapidly since I want to get to some discussion at the end. So, so again, the main idea is the same. So again, you know, you use this renewal property. So QR x zero t is the survival probability. That is the probability that the target is not found up to time t. And again, you split into two parts. You know, you say that the, what is the probability that there is no resetting? So which is e to the power minus r t times the survival probability without resetting. Always the same idea, okay? And the other thing. On the other part, when there are multiple resetting, so again you look for the time since the last resetting tau, and so in this time you have to ensure that you don't find the target, which is q zero of x zero tau, but you have to also make sure now that you did not find the target up to time t minus tau, and that is q r itself because here there can be resettings. Okay, so this is q r x zero t minus tau, and as usual you have to average the tau with drawn from exponential distribution up to t. Okay. So this equation is very simple to understand, but the difference be, be, with before uh, in the probability distribution for the survival probability, you have this additional piece here. And so it's a it's a QR, so it's a self-consistent equation, a la Swinger Dyson. And uh, but the point is that since it has a convolution structure, you can still solve it by taking Laplace transform explicitly. And I'll not show you the solution, but um, you can take the Laplace transform and we can show very easily. That this Laplace transform in the presence of resetting, you can actually write in terms of the Laplace transform in the absence of resetting. So if you know this object, then you know this object. So it's just a simple function like this. Okay. And this object we know because we have just computed the uh, survival probability without resetting. This is just an error function. So you can you know take the Laplace transform of that. It's just very simple, just a one minus exponential this. And this gives you an exact result for the survival probability in the presence of resetting. Okay, using this, uh, plugging in this result here, you just get this simple, simple result. Okay. And once you have that, from that you can calculate the mean first passage time, and which is just the Laplace uh, transform exactly evaluated at s equal to zero. And what you find is a very nice and simple result. So first of all, it's a finite result. It's not infinite. Okay, within in the presence of R. Okay, it's uh, it's finite, so that means any amount of resetting already improves your search time. Okay, and moreover, when you plot this function, what you find is a very interesting behavior. So I'm plotting the mean first passage time as a function of resetting rate r for fixed x naught and uh, diffusion constant d, and as a function of r, you see that it it diverges. This is just a simple function here. So it diverges as r goes to zero. Okay, and as one over square root of r. And uh, it diverges when r goes to infinity as uh, e to the power square root of r. Okay, so it diverges at both limits, and physically it's clear why it diverges in both limits. So r goes to zero limit, that means no resetting limit. I told you it diverges because there are trajectories that wanders off in the opposite direction of the target. Okay, so it takes a huge amount, enormous amount of time to to find the target. That's why it diverges. Now in the opposite limit, r goes to infinity. Why does it diverge? Because r goes to infinity limit, you are resetting all the time with a very high rate. That means you are constraining your trajectory to be highly localized around the initial position x naught. So as a result, again, it gets totally localized around x naught and it doesn't find the target. Okay, So that's why it diverges in this limit as well. And if it diverges in both limits, there must be a minimum 
somewhere around you know in between. I mean, that's what you would expect, and it does because this is a simple function. You can plot it and see. And this optimal value, so that means there's an optimal resetting rate R star at which these there is a minimum. Okay, that means the search time becomes minimal when if you choose your you know resetting rate to be this optimal value. Okay, and that's a sort of and you can compute this optimal value just by you know minimizing this function, and it's just given in terms of dimensionless variable gamma. Which is just a root of this transcendental equation. Okay, so so this is but the main point is that there is an optimal value which uh, which optimizes your search process and so not resetting not only helps you to make the mean first passage finite but it also makes it optimal if you choose it appropriately. Okay, that's the main main message of this. And then you know you can do this simple calculation in higher dimension also. I'll not go into the details just to show you the results. In higher dimension, you have a target, and you have to you know for d bigger than two, you have to put the target to have a finite radius of size a, and you have a target which starts at r naught, and it does again diffusion and then resetting, diffusion resetting, etc. And you can again calculate the survival probability, and from that the mean first passage time, and you can write the solution in terms of simple Bessel functions. And, but the main point is that there is, again, if you plot these functions, uh, again, you find that there's an optimal resetting rate R star, which of course varies with dimension D, but in all dimensions, there's an optimal resetting rate uh, that, that optimizes or you know, makes your search process most efficient, okay? So this optimal resetting rate then was found in many, many different models and it almost you know, became a paradigm and was very robust, I mean, going beyond diffusion and many, many other problems. And uh, so there are, you know, very, very lots of examples. I cannot have time to go through all these things, even for Levy flights, anomalous diffusion, and so on. And then, you know, memory dependent reset, then quantum dynamics with reset, active particles with reset, a very, very long list. So with Martin Evans and Gregory Shen, we wrote a recent review. Recent means it's already three years old, so because the subject is very rapidly developing. And uh, but this is you can find uh, for many topics of interest, uh, many subjects of interesting thing there. So I thought I will talk about uh, the Levy flights, but I, I think because the time is running out, so I'll I'll skip this because there's some interesting phase transition here. I'll go to the directly to the experiments. Okay. So I talked about the theoretical model so far. So let me go to experiments now. Okay. What about the experiments? Okay. So. So the, I, there are two recent experiments uh, and one from the group of uh, Yale Reitman from Tel Aviv University that I already mentioned in the beginning. And there was a, another experiment uh, from the group of Sergio Siliberto from Equal Normal Leo. And I was involved uh, uh, in, in that experiment with uh, Sergio Siliberto. So I'll just briefly talk about uh, that experiment. And so what you do in this experiment is, as I mentioned, that this is done with optical traps. Uh, so you have dilute particles in some, you know, some liquid. Uh, and uh, so they diffuse. Uh, and, uh, and what you can do is you can just switch on an optical trap. And so this is the setup of the optical trap that you see. And, uh, and then, uh, so you can you can record the trajectories of the particles. You know they do diffusion, and when you when you switch on the trap, they get localized around this. So this is like the resetting, and uh, and you can actually you know do this you know whatever uh, spectroscopy uh, these things they can measure the trajectory of the particles. Uh, so they do it both to two different protocols, either Poissonian protocol, which is you know exponentially distributed interval between resetting. And they also do periodic. This is this picture is for periodic resetting. So uh, periodically they reset the system. Okay. So the idea is that so uh, resetting is so how you know how do you actually implement the resetting? In theory, our numerical simulation is very easy. You just take the particle and put it back to the origin. But in reality, I mean, in the in the real lab, I mean, when you are doing experiments, so you can do it by optical trap. You switch on the optical trap, and then you let the particles diffuse uh, in, the, in the optical trap and relax to its equilibrium. And uh, the equilibrium is, of course, in a harmonic trap, it will be just a Gaussian distribution, OK? And, and then you know once it relaxed, then you again switch off the trap and let the particles diffuse. And you alternate these two uh, phases, basically. So this is like diffusion followed by resetting, diffusion followed by resetting. And during the relaxation time inside the trap, when the trap is switched on mode, you do not make any measurements because you know that's like an instantaneous resetting, if you like. But the main problem is, and this was the question which was raised in the beginning of this conference and in this uh, uh, colloquium, that you know in in this experiment, you know you cannot really re reset to a delta function, just one point, as in the as in the model that I discussed, right? So you are always reset to equilibrium distribution, which is a Gaussian and which has a finite width sigma, 
If sigma was zero, then it will be exactly a delta function. And that would be exactly, you know, mimicking the theory. But with the finite sigma, uh, you know, it's no longer, um, no longer the theoretical model. So this experiment raised an interesting question that what happens when uh, there is a finite width of the resetting uh, position? So that means you are not resetting to exactly to the initial position, but you're resetting to a random position drawn from a Gaussian distribution, okay? And this is the sort of, you know, so the idea of the experiment was not just to mimic the theory or do the simulation, uh, but it was to, you know, these kind of new questions came up from the experiments, which was very interesting. And so what they measured with this protocol, they measured the mean first passage time and uh, for a target uh, with a fixed uh, located at a distance L. And they can do multiple particles and also single particles. So I'm just telling you the single particle results now. And what you find is very interesting. So here, you have an additional parameter, which is this L over sigma. So L is the distance to the target, and sigma is the width of your resetting distribution. So B is a dimensionless new parameter here, in addition to the uh, resetting rate R, okay? So, so resetting rate R and this B is the par parameter. So what you are plotting here is resetting, uh, mean, you know, mean first passage time as a function of this, this C is related to this resetting, uh, resetting uh, rate R for different values of sigma. So what you see, when sigma is zero, that means when B is infinity, so this is different values of B. So when B is infinity, okay, so you get this usual curve that I showed you in the theory, and it matches very well. So that means, you know, it has a single minimum and it has two maximum at the two ends, and this is the optimal value here, okay. And now you, you know, you, you consider traps with different sigma, uh, which can, you know, easily in, uh, easily monitor, easily make, make, make traps of different sigma. So when you, when you, you know, increase sigma, that means when you decrease B, what happens, you find that, you know, it's, it's no longer a, you know, monotonically increasing curve here, but it gets a maximum and then it starts decaying again, goes down again for large resetting rate. So you can understand why there's an additional minimum at R equal to infinity, because what happens with the finite resetting width is that, so target is there. So now imagine that you are resetting to a random position, but with a finite width. So the point is that once you reset, there is a possibility just by resetting, you can find the target. You don't have to do additional diffusion, right? Just by resetting. So if you infinitely often, if you reset, just by resetting, you can actually find the target very easily. That's why R, R equal to infinity, um, you know, is where the mean first passage time is almost zero because it's resetting instantaneous, so you immediately find it. So you have an, you develop an additional R equal to infinity for finite B. And then there's a, in between there is there's a maximum and but the interesting thing is that as you in, you know decrease as you increase the value of sigma or decrease uh, sorry in, in, you know increase the value of sigma here yeah, and decrease the value of b there is a critical value of bc so if b is you know about 2.53 if b is less than that this maximum disappears and it becomes a monotonically decreasing function which means that this is no longer a uh, optimal uh, resetting rate optimal resetting rate is just r equal to 0 uh, sorry, R equal to infinity, which means that you just reset. You find the target just by resetting. Okay, and uh, and this transition, this is this is like a spinodal phase transition because you have a metastable uh, minimum in this uh, mean first passage time, which give away to a global minimum, and uh, so so this is what is called the spinodal phase transition in you know in 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 uh, phase ordering systems, and so this was very interesting uh, interesting observation and. Uh, so let me now just come to the end of my talk. So, you know, so just to summarize, so I discussed, you know, the stochastic resetting and, you know, it's a very rapidly evolving field of research. And I discussed two aspects. So one is that there is a, uh, just the probability distribution of the system itself, uh, dynamics itself. Uh, it has a non-equilibrium stationary state uh, and it has a sort of unusual temporal relaxation. And for the simple diffusion, it has a second order dynamical phase transition there in the relaxation. And relaxation is non-uniform in space. And the second aspect was the original motivation, namely the search aspect. That means whether resetting really you know, expedits the search process. And the answer is, yes, it does. I mean, you know, resetting always helps. Uh, and moreover, there is an optimal resetting rate which uh, expedits the search process. That means it really you know, makes the search time minimal. Uh, and as has been found in many different models. And the last thing I discuss is the experiments that there are 
you know, new interesting questions. And one of the things that we're looking at with, uh, uh, in collaboration with Sergio Siliberto is to look at the many particle situation. I discussed the theory part about it. And in the experiments, of course, these particles, there are always interactions between them. So you can ask, you know, what happens to this interacting particle system when you, uh, you know, switch on and off the trap. And that's the current problem that we are uh, studying. And there are many recent directions. So let me just list them. I mean, I not, don't have time to discuss. So one another type of questions that people have asked on in this resetting problem is uh, comes from ecology, which is the um, you know territory covered by animals when they are resetting. In once by resetting once in a while they go back to their nest, nest you know to uh, to rest and then they restart the search process. So the ecologists are interested in finding out the you know how much geometrical area is covered by such resetting ground in motion. So we can calculate several objects there. You know number of distinct size visited convex hull span etc. Then sometimes you can do resetting with memory. There's a beautiful set of paper by Danny Boyer and collaborators. And uh, so there's a lot of work with the resetting when there's a, in the presence of a memory garden. That means when you reset, you go back not to the initial position or some random position, but you go back to some sites with some, you know, some specific uh, probability uh, distribution, which depends on the past. So that's a memory and there's a lot of interesting effects there. And uh, then the resetting ground in motion with constraints. By constraints, I mean like, uh, sometimes you know your search time is limited. Like you know, a helicopter looking for a uh, risk, uh, ship, um, uh, survivor, you know, the helicopter cannot go on forever. Search cannot go on forever. It goes, typically has a time limit of one hour. So if you have a finite time limit, how does resetting affect? Uh, and there are very interesting results there. Uh, then there's a first passage resetting. Uh, so resetting that means uh, you know resetting triggers only when it uh, the process exceeds some you know given value that means when it exceeds the first passage first time it exceeds the value only then resetting happens it doesn't happen randomly the other other interesting you know more applied uh, you know applications are in stochastic optimal control theory and queuing theory there are some very interesting recent papers then the active particles which is another very interesting field of research uh, and uh, where you know what happens when the resetting noise uh, and uh, in particular, you know, when the noise itself has a memory, and this is with uh, Mathis Guma and Gregory Sherry, we looked at this problem recently. Then there's cost associated resetting. I mean, here, you know, I'm, I'm just assuming that I'm doing instantaneous resetting. I'm not associating any cost to resetting, but in reality, of course, there's always a cost to push the particle back to the origin. And so people have been studying this cost associated to the resetting and you know also this you know stochastic thermodynamics associated with it and there are a lot of interesting works in that direction and finally the most interestingly that there is now quantum many body system so you know because you can idea, apply this idea to general quantum dynamics also imagine that you have a system a state uh, which is evolving by unitary dynamics uh, it evolves uh, by e to the power minus i h t where h is the hamiltonian evolve it up to a random time and then you send the state back to the initial state and again you evolve uh, and then you know this leads to a sort of uh, non-trivial, non-equilibrium density matrix in the system, and and this has been studied in many many different recent papers, uh, and it involves you know it leads to very interesting effects. Uh, but I don't have time to talk about this quantum uh, many body system. We have a very recent paper with Manus Kulkarni uh, on on some of some aspects of this quantum many body systems, and the first time I think it was studied by. Uh, in this paper with uh, in collaboration with Bhaskar Mukherjee and Krishna Dushan Gupta from India. And, um, but it has now picked up quite a bit, uh, this quantum uh, quantum resetting problems. Uh, and so let, and, uh, and there are many other directions, of course, which I could not touch upon. So the main message is that stochastic resetting is a very rich and interesting uh, static and dynamic classical and quantum phenomena. And, uh, you know, uh, many new unexpected features are coming up, which is very interesting. And there was a recent uh, JFIZ, you know, the special issue, uh, well, recent prints about two years old now, and um, or last year perhaps, I mean, uh, which was edited by Onupam Kundu and uh, Slomi Ruveni, which has many, many recent applications that I mentioned here. I didn't have time to go through all these papers and you can, if you're interested, you can have a look at that. And let me just finish by uh, acknowledging my collaborators. Uh, so there are many graduate students involved, uh, Marco Viroli, Ivan Vurene, Benjamin Di Brumin, Costantino Di Bello, Mathis Dono, Matteo Magani, and Francisco Mori. And Francisco Mori, he was my PhD student and now he just moved to Oxford for his postdoc. Uh, and um, 
and there are you know i was very fortunate to collaborate with many many people i started this working in this field with martin events uh, and we are still continuing many work in that direction and with sergio silibarto uh, with denny boyer and you know many other people here and in particular with uh, gregory sher with whom i you know i work quite closely on many topics not just on resetting and uh, so i thank all of them and um, and here are some some selected references uh, in case you are interested so thank you very much for your attention okay thank you um, for a very nice and very introductory talk about capacity resetting okay so is there some questions uh, i think uh, we have uh, one question in the message yes Maybe i can read in the chat room so thank you for the wonderful talk. I have one quick question. What happens to the first passage time if Brownian gas has correlated resetting instead of independent resetting? Oh, you mean the uh, when the resetting events themselves are correlated? I guess that's what uh, that's what it means, sir. Yes. So the point is that you no, know, this is a good question because this is related to the thing that I discussed about resetting with memory. Because when the resetting events are correlated, there's a memory kernel. And uh, with this memory kernel, it's uh, you know it's extremely hard to solve the first passage problems. Mm -hmm. So there are <clears throat> very few problems where for which you can solve the first passage probability in the uh, in the presence of mem memory, and uh, and because the process becomes extremely non-Markovian, and uh, so the there is no general answer for that. So I mean there are some you know specific cases you can solve, but in general you cannot solve. Well, I think the question is uh, maybe that i mean that so in your talk the brownian gas you simultaneously is set to the ah, simultaneously uh, setting okay but yes. now his position is what happened if the resetting is independent ah, okay so re if resettings are if resettings are independent then it's a kind of trivial problem because then it just yeah. becomes a single particle to the power n basically so you yeah. can so i mean whatever you find for the single particle you find here the main point was when you yes. do simultaneous resetting you know, yeah. you have this, uh, you have this uh, correlated gas, basically, you generate a correlated gas by resetting, and uh, which still allows you to make uh, non trivial predictions of various uh, observables. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I have, can I ask you a question? Sure, sure. please, please. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, the, I, in fact, I have two questions. One is, is um, the, uh, um, the efficiency of resetting for 1D random walks uh, is essentially due to the fact that if the walk is going on the wrong side, uh, yes. it helps. Okay, so uh, which means that um, if you go to a higher dimension, mm -hmm. the, the more the more the dimension, the higher the dimension, the more efficiency the resetting should be. Correct? Yes. Absolutely, this is true. So we have studied, you know, the the uh, in all all dimensions you can solve the uh, in all dimensions, and in fact, what you find is precisely as you said, the you know, I mean, as you increase the because in a higher dimension there is a the the for d bigger than two, the particle has a finite probability to escape into infinity. You know? Yeah. So therefore, yeah. you know, resetting is much more use you know much more useful in higher dimensions than one dimension. I okay. Mean, for so transient so, blockers. So my, my other question is that uh, when you're resetting, you're essentially extracting entropy, uh, information entropy from from the statistical distribution of particles, yeah. right? Exactly. So is yes. is there any any interesting uh, thing to to say about you know absolutely. entropy absolutely. trajectory? So is there even uh, using the entropy extraction? Uh, is there anything uh, that can be yes. used to, yes. to to derive the stationary probability, stationary state probability that is directly a consequence of of uh, cancelling the effect of uh, uh, entropy extraction and entropy increase between two yes. settings. No, this is this is a good question. In fact, in fact, I mean, the, you know, the entropy production uh, in the resetting process. This was this has been studied, uh, and there was a very recent paper from the Stockholm group, uh, and also my, my student Francisco Mori was involved in that. And they indeed, I mean, uh, the, they, they looked at the, you know, they, they calculated the, the, um, the entropy production uh, in the stochastic state, but I'm not sure if they uh, looked at, uh, if you can derive the stationary state just by the balancing the 
production, entropy production, and the and the loss term. So this I don't know, but at least they studied. You know, the for example, you can ask. You know, how does the uh, entropy production grow with time, and you know, and uh, and how does it saturate? And uh, so this this has been studied uh, quite recently. In fact, I mean. Okay, but, but so this so, is so, a group from uh, Shupriya Krishnamurti, Francisco Mori, and some other people. I don't remember the names. Yeah. So okay, so I'll ask you in private. Yeah. Okay. okay sure. Yeah. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> okay. Thank you for questions. So some uh, some uh, what some other questions? Uh, can I can I ask some question? Yeah. Sure. Please. Yes. So uh, you uh. I understand that the resetting makes something like a effective linear uh, potential. Uh, yes. So, but in one dimension, in one dimension. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Then the first passage time can be explained by the effective potential, or is there any other uh, uh, additional uh, effect by resetting? No, first passage time you cannot get from an effective potential because the effective potential occurs only at long time limit in the stationary state. Okay, but first passage is a time dependent question. So to calculate the first passage, you know, you you have to solve the dynamics problems. You cannot just get it from an effective potential in the stationary state. Mm. Oh, thank you. Okay. Good. Oh. What else? Uh, I'm just curious that uh, it, it, the last few pages, I'm curious that mm -hmm. I was amazed that uh, the st stochastic resetting field is very much developed. So that yes. simply I'm just questioning, is, is there any problems left? <laughs> No, what there are lots of, of, no, of yeah. so I mean, as I mentioned several times, yeah. you know, there are there are many 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 different problems left. For example, I mean, just to give you one 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 uh, open problem, okay. I mean, just take the Ising model, okay. Yeah. So just take the Ising model and evolve it by global dynamics, okay, and do the resetting, and then you ask, you know, how does the correlation function, the spin spin correlation function, how does it behave? Uh -huh. I mean, we know exactly what happens without resetting, okay. Uh, so it's exponentially decaying, and then uh, you know exactly at the critical point it has a power law decay, and below this oh, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. a constant plus this. Uh, so I, I'm just curious to know, for example, what happens to the correlation function? Okay, I, I mean, do, I mean, in order to see this long range order, so this you know many body system, you know there are many things which are uh, which are not not been explored yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one one uh, one problem, uh, one one set of problems which are. Uh, which had not uh, not addressed yet, and also the dynamics of relaxation towards the stationary state in many body systems that have not been uh, you know addressed very much, uh, and um, except in few few cases, uh, and uh, then the, the 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 other interesting set of uh, you know problems that uh, that uh, you know that people are looking at is that when the resetting event is uh, conditioned. On some other event, like you know, Sid Redner and uh, his uh, collaborators, they are looking at the problem when the resetting is triggered. Like they, are, you know, their motivation was that, like you know, um, there is often you know load shedding. That means you know, I mean, you know, in electrical electrical grid, there is a power failure, and this happens when you know the voltage exceeds some critical value, mm -hmm. and then it resets. That means you know all the power collapses basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or in the context of finance, also you know, so there are similar questions, uh, you know, happens. I mean, so so there are. I mean, I think there are many many interesting questions which are which are uh, you know still very much open. I mean, so I mean, in fact, I mean, you know, when we started this, I mean, it was just. I mean, we are not even thinking of so many applications. I mean, we just you know wanted to study a simple model and see what happens. I mean, uh, and and but then you know it it has really gone into different areas and in chemistry also people are using it in enzyme reactions uh, and other things i mean so it, it has really really developed and i think there are many many and you can you know nice thing is that you can think of different resetting protocols right as was discussed in this during yeah. this talk i mean you know so i mean you can cook up in your in anything i mean uh, and in many practical situations you have actually different resetting pro protocols or different uh, these protocols so you can actually there's an infinite number of open problems here i mean which are very interesting and then and the experiments also developing which are you know giving rise to new questions i mean uh, so that's uh, that's what i find it i mean it's a very dynamic field it's really evolving quite rapidly so which is uh, which I find interesting. But, so. but as you mentioned that uh, uh, compared to the theoretical study, uh, 
uh, they are quite less uh, experimental. Uh, That's true. That is that is true. I mean, so yeah, absolutely. There are only only two two very recent experiments, uh, yeah. and I, I think um, both groups they are continuing and hopefully, I mean, and there have been some, probably some other recent experiments I've seen also, but uh, which I didn't cite uh, in this uh, talk. But um, so yeah, so it's it's developing. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not yet. You know, somehow the theoretically, it's uh, it's very you know appealing and simple model, right? So yeah. that's why people do it very quickly. But experiments take time, so they have to set up. Yes. No, <laughs> in fact, it took quite some time for Sergio Silibato to even, you know, come up with a protocol, experimental protocol that can mimic resetting. I mean, yeah. so how do you do that? I mean, so, you know, I mean, I didn't mention. So what happens is that, so what you needed, what they needed is to, you know, they switch on the optical trap, but you want to make the relaxation very fast mm -hmm. inside this optical trap in order to mimic the real resetting, right? And so what they developed is something called the swift engineering equilibration, okay? They call it uh, ESC techniques. Uh, so this is, I mean, it's a very interesting problem by itself, non-equilibrium problem. So imagine that I give you a target stationary state. Mm -hmm. And so if you do your natural dynamics, like Ising model, global dynamics, you know, it, it might take a long time to reach there, right? Mm -hmm. So so what they call it, they call it a shortcut dynamics to adiabaticity. So that means, you know, given the target state, you can find out the whole, you know, dynamics, I mean, out of all possible dynamics, you can think of a, you know, dynamics, which can somehow take you to, uh, to the st final state very quickly. And this is what is called the, you know, um, swift engineering, engineered swift equilibration, ESC techniques, mm -hmm. which is his celebrator's group has developed quite a bit. And uh, so he actually used that technique here. To, to relax these particles in the equilibrium because you know these Gibbs state inside the trap. So you can actually go there very fast, basically. So, so the, this is a new experimental protocol that the, they have developed. And so, so, so it's a lot of, you know, things which are developing and, uh, you know, in connection to this problem, which is nice. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I hope that there'll be more experiments in near future also, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yes, so. Some other comment or questions? No. If if not, then maybe uh maybe we can uh, stop uh today colloquium now. And let's thanks again, uh, Professor Majumda for the very nice talk. And I hope to see you in Pohang. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure. <laughs> thanks. Bye bye. Thank bye, bye. You. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, see you everyone. Bye-bye.